Second Temple Judaism. Some guiding questions may be worth noting at the beginning and as we uh, engage this rather difficult history. Uh, difficult in the sense that there are lots of changes of power and uh, people coming and going in it, people whose names we aren't necessarily familiar with. Our goal here is to gain some overview of uh, this period and get a sense of what's going on so that we can indeed understand the setting for Jesus' ministry. So the first question would be, how is it that the New Testament is written by Jews in Greek? Also, how does the intertestamental history of Israel relate to Jesus' ministry? Third, why was John the Baptist opposed to Herod Antipas? And how were John's and Jesus' ministries connected? How was Rome's rule of Israel in the first century significant for Jesus? And what were the different factions of Jews at the beginning of the first century? What two options were there for Judaism when its central focus, the temple, was destroyed? What is the kingdom of God? How can it be present and future? And how does it relate, of course, to the contemporary political and religious situation in the first century? How does Jesus' authority, finally, relate to his message of the kingdom? As we go through this history, you may well uh, wish to have your own copy of this handout listing the dates and events um, of the time period. And we're going to begin this uh, with noting that Israel had been divided during the Old Testament period between the north and the south. The northern kingdom, or Samaria, or Israel, is taken into captivity by the Assyrians in 722 BC. The southern kingdom lasts until the beginning of the 6th century and it is destroyed. Um, Jerusalem is destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, who begins his invasion in 597 and in 586-87 uh, BC uh, Jerusalem is destroyed and then the exile takes place that have been prophesied by prophets. This rule underneath foreign powers uh, is something that is mentioned by Daniel. In Daniel chapter 8 verses 20 to 21 there is a reference to the kingdoms that come after Babylon. As for the ram, Daniel writes, as for the ram that you saw with the two horns these are the kings of Media and Persia. The kingdom of the Medes and the Persians take uh, over from the Babylonians. And then he goes on to say in verse 21, And the goat is the king of Greece. That would be Alexander the Great. And the great horn between his eyes is the first king. This uh, time of exile comes to an end still within the 6th century B.C., there's not a single return of Jews from exile. There are several, several returns that we pick up on as we read Nehemiah and, and Ezra. There are also uh, many Jews who are left scattered outside of Israel in what we would call the diaspora. And that continues right up until the time of the first century and in fact way beyond, uh, even to uh, our own time period, there are Jewish communities living outside of Israel in far-flung places of the world. That will be a rather important point to note as we listen to what Jesus' ministry um, is all about. Uh, many have argued that in more recent times that Jesus' message is a message that picks up on the idea from the prophets that Israel would return from captivity. And so even though Jews had straggled back in a fair number to Israel in the 6th century BC, they had not all returned. That prophecy of a return of the 
Jews had not entirely been fulfilled. The temple gets rebuilt in 520 to 515 BC, and it is not at the same level of glory as we read in Ezra that, uh, uh, that the previous temple had been. Herod the Great is going to expand this temple in his time period and in the time of Jesus and uh, make it a much grander building, but it will be destroyed in AD 70 by the Romans. In the late 4th century BC, a Macedonian ruler by the name of Alexander extended Greek power and customs through a vast territory. His father had been the king of Macedon, uh, Macedonia, in uh, the northern part of Greece, and he consolidated the Greek city-states and territories and Alexander continued this effort of uh, Hellenization, as we will call it, uh, where the authority and customs of Greece are extended wherever the Greeks ruled. Alexander moves into North Africa and into Egypt. He pushes further east and uh, in his early 30s dies at the, in the year 323. BC. His four generals divide the territory that had been conquered into four sections. And the two that really concern us are the, the uh, areas that are going to be called the Seleucid Kingdom and the Ptolemaic Kingdom. The Seleucid Kingdom is comprised of Mesopotamia, Syria, and Persia. And so that is north and east of um, Israel. The Ptolemies come to rule in Egypt, which is, of course, south and west of Israel. And so part of the history of Israel at this time is a history of these two regions. Of the A look at this map shows you how vast the Seleucid Empire was in 194 B.C., not shown in the map is the capital of uh, the Seleucid Empire in the Far East on the Tigris River called Seleucia, uh, but it had a second capital toward the west, which is in italics on this map. It's Antiochia. This is the city from which Paul and Barnabas set out on the first missionary journey many years later. Rulers in this territory were worshipped as gods. And Seleucus I uh, continued the program of uh, Alexander the Great of Hellenizing the territories that were controlled by them. He turned some cities into Greek cultural centers like Beth Shean, or otherwise known as Scythopolis, which was part of the Decapolis in uh, Israel. Um, Gaza. Uh, Akko or Ptolemaeus and Gadara, uh, and he founded Greek cities like Philadelphia or Pella or Philatera. He also resettled Hellenized Jews and gave them citizenship. We can read about this Hellenization program at this time under the Seleucids in uh, the book of Maccabees. Uh, in 2 Maccabees, Chapter 4, verses 7 through 15, we read this. When Seleucus died and Antiochus, who was called Epiphanes, succeeded to the kingdom, Jason, the brother of Onias, obtained the high priesthood by corruption, promising the king at an interview 360 talents of silver and from another source of revenue 80 talents. In addition to this, he promised to pay 150 more if permission were given to establish by his authority a gymnasium and a body of youth for it and to enroll the people of Jerusalem as citizens of Antioch. When the king assented and Jason came to office, 
he at once shifted his compatriots over to the Greek way of life. He set aside the existing royal concessions to the Jews, secured through John, the father of Eupolemus, who went on the mission to establish friendship and alliance with the Romans. And he destroyed, destroyed the lawful ways of living and introduced new customs contrary to the law. He took delight in establishing a gymnasium right under the citadel, and he introduced the noblest of the Greek men to wear the Greek hat. There was such an extreme of Hellenization and increase in the adoration of foreign ways because of the surpassing wickedness of Jason, who was ungodly and no true high priest, that the priests were no longer intent upon their service at the altar. Despising the sanctuary and neglecting the sacrifices, they hurried to take part in the unlawful proceedings in the, in the wrestling arena after the signal for the discus throwing, disdaining the honors prized by their ancestors and putting the highest value upon Greek forms of prestige. Josephus also tells us about the same events in his Antiquities of the Jews. We read, therefore, they desired his permission to build a gymnasium at Jerusalem, and when he had given them permission, they also hid the circumcision of their genitals, that even when they were naked, they might appear to be Greeks. This was an operation called epispasm. Accordingly, they abandoned all the customs that belonged to their own country and imitated the practices of the other nations. Now, the period that we have in focus here is the period when Antiochus IV ruled the Seleucid Empire. His dates are 175 to 163. The epithet Epiphanes has to do with the uh, acclaim, claiming that uh, the ruler is uh, a manifestation of God. And so Antiochus IV Epiphanes captures that idea. Antiochus IV Epiphanes was uh, very uh, upset after losing a battle against the Egyptians in 168 and took his anger out on Jerusalem. He sacked Jerusalem, robbed the treasures of the temple, killed many Jews and took 10,000 of them captive. But one, thing that, one other thing that he did was he sacrificed pigs on the altar of the Holy of Holies, what Daniel calls the desolating sacrilege. And Antiochus IV Epiphanes does appear not by name, but in, in reference to him and his, uh, the horrors of his rule in Daniel chapter 11. The persecution of the Jews uh, in this period led to a revolt and the revolt took place underneath a family that came under the name the Maccabees. Before we move on, we should note also from what we've just read in 2 Maccabees and in Josephus that the high priesthood became corrupted at this time as well. Since high priests had a power and power was being um, taken by the Seleucids, we can expect that anybody in power would be a compromised person in Israel. So we have the buying and selling of the high priesthood at this time. Jason was the brother of the high priest Onias III, and he purchased the high priesthood from Antiochus IV. He also, as we read, accelerated Hellenization in Israel. Menelaus was not a Zadokite high priest, and he offered a higher payment for the high priesthood, so Antiochus appointed him in 171 BC. The high priesthood would go to the highest bidder. And also it is transferred out of the uh, family line. Uh, no longer with Menelaus do we have a Zadokite in the high priest. Many think that it's at this time that 
a group of Essenes separated themselves and created the Qumran community uh, to uh, protest the temple and its high priesthood um, and the teacher of righteousness that led them uh, was opposed to whoever was ruling uh, the temple at this period in the second century BC. Now Daniel refers to some of these events in uh, several chapters. Uh, Daniel 11.31 says, Forces sent by him, that is, we understand Antiochus, the fourth Epiphanes, shall occupy and profane the temple and fortress. They shall abolish the regular burnt offering and set up the abomination that makes desolation. The same phrase is found in several other places in Daniel chapter 8 and chapter 12. Of course, some Jews were opposed to what was going on in Israel. And the story of the Maccabees is the story of a family that opposed Seleucid rule and also what was going on in Jerusalem. It begins with the father, a priest by the name of Mattathias. He was uh, being asked, uh, about to be forced, to sacrifice a pagan sacrifice in a village known as Modin. But he instead killed the person uh, in their midst who was willing to perform the sacrifice and the Syrian soldier who was standing there to make sure it would take place. Then he and his five sons fled to the hills. It's from there that they conducted a guerrilla war against the Syrians. The first son, by the name of Judas, was very, very successful and earned the title Maccabeus, or Hammer, because of how he was able to hammer the Syrians. He retook Jerusalem in 165 BC. Antiochus IV Epiphanes had taken the city just a few years earlier. J, uh, Judas was able to reestablish sacrifice and um, rebuild the temple altar uh, in 164 BC. The stones of the first altar were dismantled and buried until a prophet might arise who could tell them what to do with them. But the rededication of the temple and the reestablishment of sacrifices became a new festival among the Jews, a feast called Hanukkah. Judas, however, was killed in 161 BC, and the youngest son then took control of the revolt. His name was Jonathan. Syria sued for peace, finally, in 157, and Jonathan, Jonathan was allowed to become high priest in 152. His willingness to negotiate with the Syrians, even as he extended Israel's territory, made him rather unpopular with certain Jews. A Syrian ruler by the name of Tryphon saw Jonathan as a threat and had him executed. This led to the rule of another one of Mattathias' sons, another one of the Maccabees by the name of Simon. He was the second son. He liberated the Jews in Galilee, but then he led them to Judea rather than to try to hold Galilee against the Syrians. Simon was the last living son of Mattathias at this time. He procured a peace treaty in 142 BC. He was elected high priest by the Jews and Israel had a certain degree of independence. Simon ruled for six years until his son-in-law assassinated him in 134 BC. Simon's son, John Hyrcanus, came to rule, and he ruled for a considerable time. He ruled from 134 to 104 BC. Part of his project was to re-Judaize the region and extend Jewish territory to include parts of Galilee, Samaria, Idumea, and some areas east of the Jordan. Still, John Hyrcanus, in some ways, appreciated Hellenism, uh, 
and a new group formed during his rule to emphasize greater fidelity to the law, a group known as the Pharisees. Their name may well come from the word paras, meaning to separate, and indeed they would separate themselves from those who compromised too much with Hellenism. Among the rulers after Hyrcanus was Salome, Alexandra, who ruled from 76 to 67. After Salome's death, her two sons, Hyrcanus II and Aristobulus II, vied for rule of Israel. It was this contesting for rule that ultimately led to Roman intervention. Neither Hyrcanus II nor Aristobulus II was able to take control until the Roman general Pompey intervened in 63 BC. Hyrcanus received help from an Idumean king by the name of Antipater, and when Pompey died in 48 BC, they appealed to Julius Caesar. Caesar appointed Antipater as the region's ruler and then withdrew his troops. But as you know, Julius Caesar was assassinated in 44 BC, and so the region uh, that was under Roman rule uh, was once again contested. Antipater's family had been ruling with the favor of the Romans. Antipater was killed at the same time, and Hyrcanus II was captured, and Aristobulus II's son, Antigonus, proclaimed himself king. So even though we move on a little bit to other persons and even to the next generation, we still have the same contest for who would rule this region. The Roman Senate intervened in all of this and uh, ratified instead of Antigonus, the son of Antipater, a son by the name of Herod in 39 BC. We, of course, know him to this day as Herod the Great. In light of all of this killing and contesting for rule, we might reflect on, on with Jesus uh, in Matthew 26, verse 52. Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. The issue of who would rule this region of the Jews was not settled when Herod uh, began his own rule. The story of Herod's rise to power, as we've already seen, began with his father Antipater, who had assisted Julius the Caesar against Pompey at a battle in Alexandria in Egypt. Thus an Idumean, with Roman approval, rose through the ranks to become a general of Judea and governor of Idumea, which you may know by its former name better from the Old Testament as the territory of Edom. The only way to rise in power at this time was by backing the winner in contests for power. And Antipater did just this until he himself was finally poisoned in 43 BC. Now the question is, who would rule? Antipater had made Herod a ruler of Galilee, while his brother Phasel ruled Judea. Both had to concern themselves with the remaining descendants of the Hasmonean dynasty. And when Phasel opposed Aristobulus II in favor of Hyrcanus II, his political game was up. The son of Aristobulus, Antigonus, invaded Palestine with support from the dreaded Parthians to the east, and so Phasel committed suicide. Herod escaped with his life, but would later be confirmed as king of the Jews. He solidified his rule a few years later by having Hyrcanus II put to death. Thus, by 31 BC, Herod had established his power over all contenders. But his fears of political intrigue continued, and he would even put his own family to death to secure his throne. Herod's family life was about as bad as it can get. 
he banished his first wife Doris and their son Antipater and married Mariamne I. Some years later he had Antipater executed for high treason. Antipater uh, before that had the mother put to death, um, Mariamne I. He also had her mother put to death, Alexandra, when she tried to claim uh, power herself. Herod also later executed their sons Alexander and Aristobulus. Uh, it became a joke that it was better to be Herod's huis, that means his pig, than his huias, that means his son. And that told a story of a man living in fear of palace conspiracies. One can only imagine what fears raced through his mind when some magi from the east arrived asking where the next king had been born. That Herod put young boys to death in Bethlehem as a result is entirely in character, even though Matthew is the only source for this story. Before that, however, in 23 BC, Harry Herod married uh, Mariamne II, the daughter of a priest named Simon Boethus, whom he had made high priest in place of the reigning high priest. Still, at this time, we see people being replaced as high priest. It becomes uh, something that the, re the ruler can do, rather than something that belongs to heredity. The two sons of Malthus and the son of Cleopatra were the sons who finally succeeded Herod the Great when he died in 4 BC. Herod desired to be known as a great ruler. He needed to be a great builder in order to leave behind himself such a legacy. Thus, he engaged in practical building projects, such as the building of Caesarea Philippi and Sebasta, which had formerly been known as the city of Samaria. He built fortresses such as those at Masada and just south of Jerusalem called the Herodium. Pictured here, you can see the Herodium is a mountain that had been cut off on the top. And this is eventually where Herod would be buried. His tomb was only recently discovered by an archaeologist in Israel. One of Herod's most grand building projects was the rebuilding of the Temple of Jerusalem, and it was being built at the time of Jesus still. Herod the Great ruled Israel until his death in 4 BC. His kingdom then was divided between his three sons. Idumea, Judea, and Samaria, pictured here in yellow, were ruled by Archelaus until AD 6. At that time, the Romans removed him because he had been such a bad ruler, and so they replaced him with their own Roman procurators, among whom eventually would be Pontius Pilate. Galilee and Perea, two territories that were not adjacent to each other, were ruled by Herod Antipas until A.D. 39. This is the Herod whom John the Baptist criticized for marrying his brother's wife. The territories are pictured here in blue. Herod Philip ruled Iturea and Trachonitis, shown here in brown, until his death in A.D. 34. The Decapolis consisted of ten independent cities under Roman rule, and yet Jesus also had some ministry in this region. A number of resources point to the kind of political and uh, religious situation that we find at the time of Jesus. One such author, J. Massenburg Ford, uh, has written a book called My Enemy is My Guest, Jesus and Violence in Luke. She notes that Israel in the first century AD was a seething cauldron pre preparing for revolt the causes of unrest included Roman occupation, class conflicts, including anti-clericalism, social banditry, and one term for bandits is lestai, uh, 
a term that is used for those crucified with Jesus. It could refer just to people who are bandits, or it could refer to people who are insurrectionists. Indeed, both activities uh, were often uh, undertaken by the same people. In the 60s, there was a group called the Sicarii, named after the short Roman sword, the Sicarius, that they would use in assassinating people in crowds. Hiding these short swords in their robes, they could sneak next to somebody and then just stab them and then disappear into the crowds again. Another uh, cause of unrest was religious fanaticism, she says, and the concept of God as a divine warrior. And with this, she has in mind the group that take Israel into their first war with the Romans in 66 AD, the group uh, known as the Zealots, with their concept of martyrdom and holy war. There are also revolutionary prophets and messianic pretenders. For example, in AD 6, someone by the name of Judas the Galilean tried to fight against the Romans. He began this uh, by um, fighting in the city of Sepphoris, which is just a few miles outside of the town of Nazareth. And so at this time, Jesus is about 12 years old when Judas the Galilean, just down the road, begins an insurrection. AD 36 saw a Samaritan uh, promising to reveal the sacred vessels which Moses had hidden on Mount Gerizim arise. In AD 44 to 48, someone named Thutis, who is also mentioned in Acts 5, uh, told followers to follow him to the Jordan with their possessions. And in AD 52 to 60, there's a prophet who called uh, crowds to the desert and promised to do miracles. Sometime in the 50s, there is an Egyptian prophet uh, who led his followers from the desert to the Mount of Olives. As he did so, they all expected that Jerusalem's walls would fall at his command. And in 60 to 62, there was another prophet who was even referred to as a god by some followers who called his followers to the desert to receive salvation and rest from their troubles. And Finally, in AD 62, there was someone named Jesus ben Ananias who prophesied the destruction of Jerusalem some seven years and five months before it actually happened. He was punished and he was stoned to death. These reports of these different people uh, can be found in the writings of Josephus, the first century Jewish historian. Massingbird Ford goes on to mention a cause of unrest uh, being the misconduct that Roman officials were known for. And seventh, uh, strife between the various factions of Jewish revolutionaries. Again, we might mention the Sicarii, the Zealots, but also John of Gascala and his followers and Simon Bar-Giora's party. Different parties vying uh, to rule the factions within Judaism and to oppose the Romans. There's also the problem of taxation. And one of the first things that happened as the Jews uh, took possession of Jerusalem in AD 66 and began their war against the Romans uh, was that they burned the records for taxation. There were high taxes that were imposed both by the Romans and by the Herodians. And then finally, there's the bitter hostility between the Jews and the Samaritans, which uh, even appears within the Gospels as, as one of the significant problems of the time. Roman rule in Judea began in 63 BC when the general Pompey sacked Jerusalem. The other Roman general, Julius Caesar, took control of the Roman Republic in 49 BC and was acclaimed dictator in perpetuity.
However, he was murdered by a group of senators in 44 BC. His adopted son and heir, by the name of Octavian, took control of the government after a series of civil wars. Octavian came to be known as Augustus Caesar. Once the victor, Rome was no longer a republic under a constitution, but now an empire under an emperor. Augustus Caesar ruled the Roman Empire until his death in AD 14. However, in 42 BC, the Roman Senate granted Julius Caesar the title Divus Julius, the Divine Julius. For our purposes, these transitions are highly significant. Not only did they mean that Judea was ruled by the Romans, but also that the Roman rulers were considered by many to be divine. If Julius Caesar was considered divine during Augustus' rule, then Augustus was considered the son of God. Note various titles given to Augustus Caesar by Roman authors. Augustus is called God or the living God by Ovid. Augustus Caesar, son of God, says uh, Virgil in the Aeneid. Virgil calls him the divine son of God, son of the immaculate virgin and prince of peace. Augustus erected a temple in Rome near the Tarpeian Rock with an inscription to Augustus, the firstborn of God. A temple was built between the Palatine and Capitoline hills in Rome to honor Augustus as divine in the mid-first century. The temple of Augustus uh, is uh, something that was found in other parts of the empire as well as the uh, imperial cult spread. Here, for example, is a picture of the temple of Augustus in Pula in Croatia today. The imperial cult exists uh, in the background for both Judaism and the early church in the first century, both of which rejected this cult outright. Any reference, though, to Jesus as Son of God or as Lord could be understood in this Roman Empire context against the background of a challenge to the Roman imperial cult. And even though those titles can be understood from the Old Testament in a different way, nevertheless, as the Christian religion spread in the first century through the mission to the Gentiles, these titles would inevitably have been heard as a challenge to the imperial cult. The book of Revelation in particular is a rejection of the imperial cult with the emperor Diocletian in the 90s AD making claims to divinity during his own lifetime instead of uh, just thinking of emperors as becoming divine after they died and a current emperor like Augustus being the son of God. Now in the end of the 90s, Diocletian makes the claim that he is currently divine. And here is the background for reading the book of Revelation. A few more examples of these kinds of ascriptions to the, to the C, reigning Caesar um, might be noted. <clears throat> there are inscriptions for public edifices in Ephesus that read Huias Theu, or Son of God. There are some shrines or temples that uh, take the name of Augustus Caesar um, and Augusteum, or in the plural Augustea. They were erected in many places. Uh, there are miracles that are attributed to Augustus Caesar. And in 9 BC, after the Battle of Actium, Herod worshiped Augustus as son of God. No wonder he was a favorite of uh, Augustus Caesar. And upon uh, his death, a senator by the name of Numericus Atticus claimed to see the effigy of Augustus 
ascend to heaven. Now, all of this is to describe a climate in which the Roman emperor is uh, seen as divine and is given titles like son of God. So it's rather important as we come to Mark's gospel to note what is said about Jesus. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus Messiah, that's a very Jewish way of understanding who Jesus was. But then he goes on to say, the Son of God. And the language of Son of God, we will see later in another lecture, can, re can be understood within Judaism. Uh, but it uh, would have been understood among the Gentile readers to be a direct challenge of the imperial cult. Similarly, toward the end of Mark's gospel, in 1539, we see that the Roman centurion standing at the cross uh, declares when he sees how Jesus died, truly this man was God's son. And that claim would have been directly a direct contradiction of the oath that he had taken to become a centurion to claim that Caesar was the son of God. So let's draw some conclusions. Uh, there are external forces that are shaping Israel in Jesus' day. We've talked about Hellenization and Roman rule in this light. We note that the language of Greek spreads throughout a vast area from the time of Alexander the Great and continues to be spoken into the Roman era. Indeed, the New Testament, written in the first century AD, and even to places like Rome, is written in Greek. And then we also might raise the question, what did it mean to be a pious Jew in Jesus' day? Issues surrounding the enforced Hellenization program in the second century BC were issues that were definitive for many Jews, like, for example, the importance of circumcision or uh, what kind of temple um, and, and what kind of sacrifices should be made and uh, who should be the high priest and so forth. Uh, note that it's because of Roman rule that Jesus is crucified by a Roman procurator in Jerusalem. There are also internal forces shaping Israel in Jesus' day. We've noted a variety of Jews, Jewish sects, and we will talk about them further in a later lecture. There's also the understanding of Jewish righteousness, um, that the Pharisees in particular in the Gospels are concerned about, but a group that's not even mentioned in the Gospels, the Essenes, were also extremely concerned about what was going on in Judaism in the day. There's also a dissonance between Roman rule, of course, and God's kingdom. So to come proclaiming the kingdom of God raises many political and religious questions in the, uh, in the ears of the hearers of such a message. Well, we'll continue some of these points in some uh, subsequent lectures.